Right now, uh, for our next speaker, I would like to introduce uh, the co-founder and uh, group CEO of uh, Funding Societies, um, Kelvin Teo. Kelvin co-founded Funding Societies together with uh, Renald Vijaya since 2015 when they were studying together. Uh, the company supports uh, SME owners in growing their business by providing access to funding through peer-to-peer -peer lending. The company has received backing from Sequoia and SoftBank Ventures Asia. And prior to this, Kelvin served as a consulting professional at KKR, McKinsey and Accenture. Uh, welcome, Kelvin. Thank you for taking the time for joining us. Um, when with that, um, I would like to hand over to Kelvin. Hi, Faro. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, just to uh, I'm Calvin from Funding Societies. Just to check, should I share screen uh, for the slides on my side or will you be sharing instead? Happy to do it. Either way. You, you, can, you can go ahead and share your slides. Sure. Can you all see my screen right now? Yes. Maybe you, uh, yes, yes, we can. Sure. So as a quick introduction, um, we are one of the largest SME digital financing platform in Southeast Asia, currently licensed and operating in three countries, Singapore, Indonesia, and Malaysia, and soon Thailand as well. Since our launch in June 2015, we've given out approximately $1 billion of loans to date, um, with approximately 1.5, 1.6% in default uh, cumulatively since we have started. So in this particular session, I'll be covering two parts. Really, one is the overview in terms of SME digital financing in Southeast Asia followed by um, the implication of COVID and what we've done today, um, in, as well as the early results from it. And finally, opening up for quick questions and answers to see if there's any, uh, any specific questions or comments uh, from a presentation and to, to bring the discussion forward. So SMEs are, are structurally underserved in many parts of the world, and um, this, is, it is, this is true also in Southeast Asia. Based on World Bank IFC's numbers, approximately 60% of the SMEs in Southeast Asia are either unserved or underserved. So this on the left-hand side, it is basically the credit gap for the, for the top six economies in Southeast Asia compared and benchmark against economies, um, the, the SME credit as a percentage of GDP in more developed markets um, from a study done by World Bank AFC. And the collective gap that we're seeing for micro and small medium enterprises is approximately 320 billion US dollars of which and the percentage of the unique SMEs that do not get sufficient funding ranges from 55% in Malaysia all the way to 74%. Since the, since the advent of peer-to-peer -peer lending or fintech lending in US in, um, in the early 2000s, I think it has gradually entered into Southeast Asia only in approximately 2013 in Singapore. So it's still a relatively nascent space with um, the entire SME digital financing industry accounting for less than 1% of this financing gap. And for us, funding societies who are currently present in the, the three major countries, Singapore, Indonesia, as well as West Malaysia, really looking forward to uh, looking to address the $200 billion credit gap in our three markets. And this is even including a developed economy like in Singapore. So even in a developed economy like in Singapore, there is structural gaps in terms of serving SMEs. So, so if, we, if we study in terms of the reason for for, for banks not looking to serve or not, not, not serving SMEs. I think based on the World Bank IFC results, which research which is very much consistent with the local observations that we see, the top three factors for, for the lack of uh, SME financing is really because of the macro factors. So in the case of emerging markets, there's very much export driven. Any external market shocks does impact um, the, the, SM, the economy and has SMEs very directly and making it, uh, making it a bit more, uh, more risky for banks to, to serve the SMEs. Um, regulate, uh, regulatory obstacles is often another con uh, consideration. For example, the lack of standardized ID system, national ID system or weak credit bureaus or even weak legal enforcement of contracts when uh, if a SME goes to default is a second major concern. And uh, interestingly, the third major factor that has reduced um, access for SME financing in Southeast Asia is lack of competition especially in the developed markets, whereby, hey, a lot of the local banks are serving, um, do not have, uh, are serving the market quite well. There, is, there isn't that much competition from foreign players of fintech, and consequently, a lot of, SM, a lot of the banks do not necessarily pen, uh, invest further resources to penetrate the SME financing segment. And that's, um, that's a key reason to based on research from Urban IFC, and this is very much consistent with what we've, what we've seen in our local markets as well. 
And um, because a lot of these SMEs typically are small, so it makes it not very meaningful from a from, from financial perspective for the banks to serve. Less diversified or also relatively weaker financials, which is actually a critical challenge for banks because what we notice and it, is that our default risk, interestingly, is actually lower than banks because even, uh, even though we may be serve, serving a, a perceived risk segment. And one of the key factors is that uh, banks typically focus on, three, on loans that are three to five years long. So that so as to make their risk and return um, worthwhile for serving these SMEs. If they serve these SMEs for a three months period, the interest income is not meaning, very meaningful for them um, to, to serve these SMEs. And consequently, the loan minimally is three to five years. But with external macro factors as a key driver of risk for SME loans, it actually makes a weaker financial actually directly impacts the ability for banks to serve these SMEs. And that's why because of that risk and returns, um, the short the financing gap in SME, in, for SME financing in Southeast Asia is actually quite, uh, quite prevalent. And this is true even for economies um, where even though whereby the NPR for SMEs are relatively stable. So if I just look at a reference for, for Indonesia NPLs for SMEs, it's yes, actually more or less stabilized at approximately 4% plus minus or so. So it's a segment that if you are able to price in the risk or able to assess the risk well, it can potentially provide a relatively stable return. And this CAGR of the market has been relatively attractive at approximately 10% as well. So because of, a, of, the, of, the fundamental, of a strong fundamentals for SME financing as well as steady growth, um, I think that's why we as funding societies um, were launched in June 2015, starting in Singapore, then in, in, entering Indonesia in January 2016 and entering Malaysia in February 2017 to really plug this financing gap. So, we are, we are essentially a two-sided marketplace or two-sided platform serving two constituents. On the one hand, we serve with uh, of the constituents are SMEs looking for credit, for, are looking for financing. And on the other end, um, public as well, both in retail as well as institutional investors who are looking for a liquid, stable fixed income. I think what we have done quite differently when we studied um, the overseas market is that um, we noticed that in a lot of overseas market in say US, Europe, or even China, the credit terms for these SMEs are extremely long, typically one to three years or so. But by focusing on the local needs as well as the risk returns for the SMEs, by adapting to the local market, we've actually adjusted such that um, our terms of our ten, we are primarily focusing on the smaller SMEs with a loan as small below one and a half million dollars or averaging about 100 to 200,000 and mostly unsecured short-term by nature. So our loans are on average three to four months long. So it can be as long as 18 months or, at, or, or sorry, 12 months or as short as one month for invoice financing. So we really, look, uh, we, our goal is really to complement banks which really focus on big, long, secured loans. Whereas for us, we, we really come on the, the, the opposite side of the spectrum which is small, short, unsecured loans. So by many, uh, and really focusing on the cash flow of SMEs in terms of overall underwriting. When it comes to the for public investments, I think what we have learned in other markets is that oftentimes the, part, the other markets position such alternative investment as a high yield, high, high risk, high, high return kind of investments. Whereas for us, I think when we market to the investors, we oftentimes focus on highlighting that, hey, this, the key value proposition is not high, high rates of returns but rather this is a liquid fixed stable fixed income for you because if we charge high interest rates from you we are and we make some of the investors really rich we inevitably have to make some SMEs really poor so we, our value proposition is really convenience as well as stable liquid investments because from a liquid liquidity perspective no other investment classes allow you to receive monthly repayments with very little time on spend on monitoring and due diligence um, on a case by case basis, on an individual loan basis. So by signing up a platform and creating a diversified portfolio for yourself, you can actually receive money repayments as well as have a relatively, relatively stable return. And that's the difference in terms of value proposition that we are offering relative to what you have seen perhaps in the other markets. Of course, everything has changed since the COVID-19. Um, I, th I think in terms of Southeast Asia, perhaps relative to, to, some of, to some of the overseas markets, I think the governments in Southeast Asia has taken a very proactive and potentially preemptive approach towards managing COVID-19. And it, it does, never, to, 
nevertheless, the impact on the economy has been quite severe. But thanks to these preemptive uh, uh, moves, I think that the impact has been cushioned or has been mitigated to an extent. So what has happened in Southeast Asia is that since February 20, uh, since February 2020 this year, Singapore has turned code orange in terms of overall um, dots um alerts. And if and of it officially was in, uh, entered into a uh, lockdown, um, in or what they call what we call circuit breaker in Singapore, starting from April, with the expectations of ending it in June twenty, uh, first of June this year. Where similarly for the case of Malaysia and Indonesia, both have entered into a full or an eventual partial lockdown starting from March onwards. Both of which are expecting to to finish by end of May or early June. So this is the time period for the lockdown is very much consistent with what you have seen uh, with in the other markets whereby it's spending across approximately two months period to make sure so as to contain um, the overall uh, the overall spread in terms of virus. Um, and thanks a lot for the questions from on the, on the uptick in balloon deforest. I'll actually be covering it slightly later in one two slides after this. Um, so I think overall that the 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 implication of it has been quite uh, quite quite severe, but it's to an extent mitigated by. Uh, government proactive initiatives. So I think in the case of Singapore government, the, Singap uh, the government has been very active in terms of supporting SMEs as well as um, consumers by directly crediting um, uh, jobs credit to the bank account of the SMEs without any application, which to support local employment, which I think is actually very powerful. Similarly, they have been pushing out a lot more credit facilities for the SMEs through the banks. I think from a, from a Malaysia perspective, the government has been also actively driving liquidity within the within the uh, within the economy. Perhaps most pertinent for fintech is that they have also followed the footsteps that we have seen in the UK and US, whereby the government is pumping in dollars through the fintech players. So through the, the through the Malaysian investment fund uh, or co investment fund, every two dollars that is funded by a fintech player, the government will co lend one dollar. Um, risk uh, uh, to get together, and I think that's a, a very powerful testament. In the case of Indonesia, it's a very unique situation whereby, while there's an official state of emergency and and lockdown and prevention of 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 um of the population from moving from between cities to cities, especially during this um Hari Raya period, which is also the the, the time period when China's um. The, uh, the disease actually spread across the country during the Chinese New Year period. I think there's active control in terms of overall movement, but there's also a real, real recognition that um, the trade-off between lives and livelihood in Indonesia is a lot more tricky compared to say in the case of Malaysia and, and, and Singapore, whereby the government may or may not be able to provide sufficient financial support um, to ensure the livelihoods of the population continues to, to, continues to, 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 to to be sustainable. And consequently, there seems to be a realization that hey, even with these lockdowns, there are traffic jams in the cities, um, of, of, of in the major cities. So economic activity is continuously going on. Um, and, and to an extent, in a, in a twisted way, um, the, ec uh, the economic impact is indirectly cushioned because of these ongoing economic activities. So what we what we have seen uh, our uh, on, in terms of overall local market, I think firstly is that we are very encouraged by the fact that in other in our local economies as well as in US, uh, in the European markets and selected cities uh, and states in the in US, there has been an effective flattening of the curve that we are seeing, um, and that the the economies are gradually reopening, including uh, the case of Singapore and Malaysia, whereby the current lockdown is uh, is. To, uh, it's a more partial lockdown as opposed to, uh, as opposed to a full lockdown, um, which which was the case when um, when it first started uh, in Singapore and Malaysia. So when it first started in Singapore and Malaysia, it was a full lockdown. Now it's also gradually easing. But we also recognize that the overall consumer co this reopening of the economy can only address the direct impact that COVID nineteen has on on the SMEs. So the, so the fact that you can't operate your business or you can't actively run a business, it really causes a direct impact and uh, impact in terms of the overall revenue and cash flow of the SMEs, and which will gradually be addressed by the reopening of the economies. But the indirect impact we do expect to last for a longer period of time, which is the overall macroeconomic slowdown, the overall low fall in consumer confidence. 
And this is sub, uh, something that we do expect to last on until quarter three, quarter four, um, with consumers perhaps adjusting to a new normal that they're facing. But I, I do, what we do observe is that unlike the financial crisis in 2008, which was originated by the financial, uh, financial sector, this, in this time around, the implication is the, the market shocks is really more of a real-world economic supply and demand shocks, um, which has uneven impact towards the different sectors. And to the extent that we can actually target and support as uh, sectors that are less impacted by both the direct and indirect uh, 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 in, in, impact from COVID, there is actually opportunities for continuous growth and supply of credit. So we do see a combination of risk and return, uh, risk and opportunities that is cutting across the three uh, across our two stakeholders, borrowers, investors, as well as ourselves. I think from the SME side, the key implication is a is a rise in credit risk. That there is a lot. There's a thirty to fifty percent increase in over application, but the quality of the application has fallen along along the way, um, and that there is a rise in terms of overall delinquency and also to an, also defaults in the overall industry. And I'll deep dive into it for our particular case. Yet at the same time, we do see their pockets of opportunities from different sectors. For example, FMCG is still con is continuously to go strong because it's relatively evergreen. People still need to need to spend some of their essentials. Um, healthcare clearly is booming, um, as uh, uh, as well as last mile logistics are also continuously growing. We do see the opportunity for us to serve SMEs that previously we do not have access to because there's relatively less competition. So while there's government support towards banks to give up more credit, but banks are financial, traditional financial institutions seems to be having challenges in terms of actually serving, serving them nevertheless. And, and our, and our short-term financing could potentially be a good complement towards banks' longer-term um, longer collateralized financing. From investor side, we do see a, a rise in terms of overall credit crunch or risk for credit crunch as investors start to preserve their cash so from a retail crowdfunding side, some of them for the fear of job security starts conserving cash. For the high net worth, we see some of them having to respond to margin costs and therefore um, start reducing their overall uh, investments as well. But I think one major opportunity is the rise in terms of diversification for secured loans, for example, properties, um, if, be it even for first charge and a low LTV um, to actually diversify the portfolio of these, asset, of these investors. The fact that a lot of government agencies were trying to disperse funds through liquidity through the banks but achieve limited success has also an opened up opportunity for us to actually work with government agencies to be onboarded to some programs that are that has historically been only reserved for banks to actually provide liquidity for this market, following the trend that we have seen in the US and Europe. And finally, some of the investors are starting to see, uh, see it as a, as a social responsibility towards supporting SMEs, seeing us not just as a form of investment, but really from an emotional and social perspective, supporting our local economies. I think from a fintech lenders like ourselves, we, clearly, we, have, uh, we have actually provision, at, uh, expect to increase our credit provision by, uh, by two times compared to 2019. Um, and, and this is a pro, pro, an increase in provision that we've prepared in advance. There is clearly, con, there will be, there, we do get further questions from where, uh, whether we will be a proper going concern. And as, of course, there's a rise in reputation risk whenever there's defaults for the SMEs. But we do also see this as a, this crisis as an opportunity because we can take this opportunity to streamline our business, especially stress test our algorithm in a recession and in a crisis. Because one, one of the frequently asked questions about us is that, hey, Yes, we see that you have brand name shareholders, you have good debt institutional lenders, but you have not been through a crisis. And to the extent that our credit portfolio can hold up during this crisis, we can actually move from alternative financing to mainstream, alternative from investments to mainstream. And the fact that we have raised our Series C ahead of time allowed, well, presents, but, and presents potential opportunities for M&A, just like any other well-capitalized fintech lenders. So the three things that we've actively done um, since February when Singapore turned code, code yellow is that we have, also, we have really streamlined our credit and tightened our credit underwriting to be a lot more targeted. So I think when it comes to new loans per se, we are starting to cherry pick based on growth segments. So we have segmented our industries according to, to white, gray, as well as red list industries, such that white list industries are the ones that we're actively targeting 
great lists are the ones that we're willing to consider with further diligence. And the one that are red lists is that, hey, we really don't know what will happen at the, at the short term, so let's stop from now. And this is reflected in terms of our overall origination. So our overall origination has dropped by approximately 30% since uh, February, since uh, as of April. And the whole trend has started since February. From a product perspective, we have also shifted to focus on, on invoice financing or trade financing with a stronger anchor as well as e-commerce in a more evergreen industry. From a portfolio management perspective, we have also tightened monitoring. Um, so following up with the borrowers even before the loan may have due and also improve our limit management. So in the case of Malaysia and Indonesia, we have actually actively reduced our credit limits um, or, re or revolver, credit, uh, revolver credit limits from the for the borrowers. And finally, from an engagement perspective, we've actually built a step up in terms of overall collections and expanded our collections team ahead of time. Um, we do consider um, repay principal de uh, repayment deferment um, only on the conditions that A, the other lenders for that particular SMEs are also doing so, and B, we do see a reasonable chance of repayments if we do give a deferment, as opposed to using it for the case of window dressing. So really at taking a responsible and active approach towards uh, engaging uh, SMEs for repayments and collections. So, so far, our cohort defaults have held up relatively well. Um, so I think historically, our cohort defaults have, has been approximately 1% to 3%, uh, depending on the quarters that we're in, and averaging approximately 1.6% in terms of overall cohort defaults. And that, having said that, we do recognize that the lockdown, which is the direct impact of COVID, has only started in March, April uh, for, for most of our economies. And consequently, and, and it will likely, and most SMEs have one to two months of cash, uh, typically in their bank account to sustain any shocks. So we do, ex so we do expect, we do rec uh, recognize that the current cohort defaults is still relatively early and the full blow effect will likely only show up in May or, uh, May or June. Or end of June when the whole lockdown is, is fully is fully open up and when SMEs may or may not have fully depleted any cash reserves that they have, but I think to date our deforest has, has is currently has gone up by approximately inch up at, by approximately zero point two percent from one point six to one point eight percent as of April, and in terms of overall over delinquency for loans between one to ninety days DPD has increased by about two point three percent of our loan outstanding of which we expect or estimate approximately half of which will eventually go into default. So we, do, we have seen implications in our overall portfolio, but so far I think compared to the other, the other platforms or the other markets, I think so far has been, a lot, uh, has been, more, has been relatively controlled and it's something, it's something that we're actively monitoring given that it's still relatively early days. And we recognize that this is an ongoing uh, evolving uh, event, world event. Uh, be it in terms of the timeline for lockdowns, in terms of um, in, uh, both credit as well as credit, in terms of credit crunch as well as credit risk. And therefore, we have also actively set up a task force across three countries to really make, make sure that to, we actively manage our PL in terms of our overall runway as well as credit provision for our lenders and capital, capital buffer, buffer for institutional lenders, risk management to plan out various, um, various scenarios and react to various government policies, as well as working to our, to, with our team members to continue constantly update of what is happening and provide and to and aligning the team so that we can really use this crisis as a way to streamline our business such that in quarter three, quarter four, when the market enters into a new normal, we actually emerge stronger um, and uh, stronger than before. So I think recognize that there's, I think I know that I have only five, 10 minutes left. I think this is so far, so we have been speaking to various economies um, as well as um, for, as well as experts and advisors, um, including joining World Bank IFC's cause, uh, global cause um, in, in response to COVID-19. And we recognize that this is, a, this is a crisis that no one has ever experienced in their lifetime, or it's very different from what has been experienced. And so far, this is perhaps one of the best the best advice that I've received um, to date, which is really slow and steady wins the race. There is a panic that, hey, our revenue has dropped by, by uh, drops uh, correspondingly because of our fall in terms of overload origination. But we do recognize that this is a very important uh, phase for us to, to control our disbursement based on the risk categories of the SMEs, as opposed to trying to accelerate the pace in this particular uncertain market. And, uh, and very critically, we do expect to only restart lending in a, in a, 
in a not in a regular pace um, in July August after one month after the markets have opened because what we have seen is that other markets seems to have the default the first cohort tends to have uh, to be worse uh, the worst performing and and on top of that we have been actively um, loading up on cash as well as closing off debt transactions so that uh, when the market recovers, we'll actually take advantage of post-recovery in the most efficient way. So with that, let me just take a pause for any questions and thoughts. Yes, uh, Kelvin, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I think you did go through um, the one of your slides on the loan default rates and uh, how, how, how the company, yes, this one. Now, um, what, the other question that I have, I think that's the only question we can take right now is, um, uh, the how how does uh, funding society uh, likely to uh, mitigate going forward um, the default experience as a consequence of uh, uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic effects that we have currently in this region? Sorry, the question is how does funding societies in funding what on the pandemic? No, uh, it's one of the questions has asked. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, to share your historical default experience, which I think is the case. But uh, the second part of the question oh. is, uh, how is that likely to evolve um, going forward as a consequence of uh, the COVID-19 economic effects? Sure, I understand. I think there are two parts to it. I do think that, at least our hypothesis is that there will be likely two ways of of impact from COVID. Um, one wave is what we have already experienced, which the, is the SMEs that are, that are in are immediately hit by the COVID-19 impact and therefore is shown on our delinquency. But we do expect likely put, uh, another wave in closer to May, June during this period of time, whereby SME starts, um, starts depleting, has not gone into delinquency yet because they have cash reserve. But depending on the extent of the overall lockdowns and as well as the recovery of, of, the, of the macroeconomy, uh, some of them may actually enter into default or delinquency because they have run out of their cash reserves. So we do expect another wave to happen. But, we, but I think overall, we ex compared to where we were in terms of default, which is possibly 1.5%, we expect that the worst case scenario of our default is probably going to go up to 3% um, if we stretch it and we, if, we factor, uh, if, if, we, uh, if, if we stretch the overall um, of, of our worst case scenarios um, as, the, as COVID evolves. I think from a recovery perspective, I think there's a pre-COVID and a post-COVID answer. Pre-COVID, our recovery rate um, across the region has been approximately 30, 40 percent after defaults. Um, but in all candor, we do not know post-COVID what will be the numbers yet. So to an extent, what we kind of charge, we, we basically take both specific and general provisions into account. So general provisions based on historical defaults, um, default rates and specific provisions, which is basically the cases that we know is, have already fallen into delinquency. Right. 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 Thank, uh, I have to stop you there, uh, Kelvin, due to time constraint. Um, uh, with that, uh, we've come to the end of our presentation slot. I would like to thank uh, Kelvin for that brilliant presentation, um, very inf informational. Um, for the rest of our attendees, if there's any follow-up questions, uh, please, uh, you can go ahead and send your question directly to Calvin via the ebook that's been sent out to you. Yeah, all and right. my email is on the first slide, so uh, well, yes. I'm happy to connect with all of you. Right, email is there. Uh, you can send the question directly to him. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Calvin. Thanks again. Thank you. Have a good one. Cheers.